until you find the optimum position for your legs sitting on the chair. What you're doing here is you're developing mindfulness, awareness, so you're focusing, you just know that part of your body is there, how are they? And you're also practicing kindness. You're kind enough to your legs to take time finding the best possible position. And then you look at your bottom, your butt, your bum. How is it on the chair? People fidget when they're sitting on chairs because they don't spend enough time making sure their bottom is comfortable on the chair. I don't know why it is, but I always get the big chairs with the big cushions, <laughs> even though I carry my own upholstery. It's called fat. Can I get myself comfortable? And then, how's your back? You can experiment. You lean back against the chair, is that comfortable? Lean up. What's the best for you? And if any of you are ever sleepy when you meditate on a chair, you can always get a seatbelt to put on the chair. Stop your falling off. <laughs> that helps. So get your back nice and straight, or whatever feels the best for you. The mindfulness, the awareness, feeling the sensations in your own body allows you to have what we call feedback. I move it forward, it feels one way, move it backwards, it feels another way. So I can compare and find the best position when you're aware with feedback. And then kindness, compassion, chooses the best possible position for my own back. My hands, you can put them in your lap, on your knees, on the armrest, wherever your arms are comfortable. Experience, focus, feedback, kindness. To move the hands to the best possible position for you. Go back up to your shoulders to relax them. You can imagine your shoulders like a bunch of muscles. Imagine like rubber bands. Sometimes they're stretched at both ends. Stretched so much it causes stress, tension. So you can imagine your shoulders, if they're tight, being pulled at both ends. Imagine the letting go. Letting go of the pulling or the pushing. And then you can maybe experience your shoulders relaxing. And you'll go back up to your, your neck. If you have a cough, remember to focus on your neck, experience the itch and find out what it needs just to relax. You will notice that fear, control, <coughs> causes more tension. Just letting go, relaxing, allowing that feeling to be, relaxes it. <coughs> but please, if you do feel irritated and the cough is coming, for a good mistake, don't suppress it. There's something in meditation we call the volcano effect. You don't want to cough, so you suppress it, you bug it up, it's going to blow. And when it does, it's incredibly loud. And like other volcanoes, you spray very unhealthy stuff about everybody next to you. Then go up to your head making sure that's comfortable, especially see if you can be aware, feel with your mind the muscles around your eyes and your mouth. It's 
especially around the eyes, because that is a sign of tightness, tension, or relaxation. And once you're aware of those feelings around your eyes, it's just so easy just to let go and relax. And you can feel the muscles easing off. And once your face is relaxed, you're going to go upon your whole body, just one unit, relax in a very good meditation posture, they call it. You can feel it, it feels good. But now we're going to go deeper in relaxation of your body. Now I invite you to look at through your body and find the most irritating part of your body. The part which is painful or itchy or heavy, aching. If you have things like irritable bowel syndrome, recovering from a cancer, uh, some injury in the body. Just it will soon stand out as the most prominent feeling in your body. Like on Google Maps, zoom in on that feeling. Zoom in on it, fill the mind with it. And as you're mindful of the ache, the pain in your own body, see what you need to do to relax it. Not getting rid of it, but being kind to it opening the door of your heart to that feeling. <coughs> if you're doing it with real kindness, real letting go, you may notice that the irritation or pain gets less intense. You're relaxing that your own little body part, just one little part of it, focusing on the most irritating part, and learning how to be kind, letting it be, and the mindfulness giving the feedback to see what works. With a tiny bit of training, you find you can relax almost any part of your body. Mindful, <coughs> kind, relaxed. And you also discover that because you're doing something which is really <coughs> important for your own peace and happiness and health, you find that you're in the present moment you haven't been thinking of the past or the future. You've been quite taken up by mindfulness of the different parts of your body, relaxing them, healing them. So it's what we call a skillful means to be able to relax your own body and create very good health. And once your body is relaxed, we can just go to our mental, emotional world, the world of our mind. And to begin with, I invite you to be aware, mindful of what I call the peace ometer. Just like in a car you have a meter which tells you how much petrol you have left in the, in the, in the uh, and the gas cylinder, whatever it's called, sorry, the tank. You have mindfulness, the meter which tells you what speed you're going. And that speedometer gives you feedback. If you press the accelerator harder, the speedometer goes up. If you release 
the pressure, the speedometer goes down. That's how you drive at the right speed, right speed limits. The speedometer gives you feedback. The piezometer, you can, I ask you, how peaceful are you right now? From one to ten. One means really peaceful. Ten means very agitated. From number one to ten, how peaceful are you? Again, that's a little trick to make you aware of this quality called the peaceometer. Once you're aware of how peaceful you are or not, you have the ability to have feedback. What do you need to do to move that needle closer and closer to one? To become more peaceful and less agitated. You'll find that just being kind to this moment, opening the door of this moment, to, of your heart to this moment, no matter what it is, you find that the mind becomes more peaceful and you're aware of that, the peaceometer. Your mind becomes more and more calm, more and more peaceful, more and more aware of the heavenly music, which I hope is not an iPhone. It's bad karma to have your mobile phones on during meditation. Not so much for you, bad karma for your mobile phone. In its next life, your mobile phone will be reborn as a parking meter. <laughs> the lowest form of life and technology. <laughs> You're with the peaceometer. What makes you more peaceful? What makes you agitated? Letting things be. Being kind. Feeling safe. Not being judged. Just be here, enjoying this moment. You relax to the max. What does it feel like to be peaceful? Meditation, peace of mind, is not something you do what happens when you stop doing things. It's like a default state. Just being here. Not going anywhere. Just being here. At peace. Relaxing. Going back, return to the simile of the rubber band. You can change that to a guitar string, or maybe a violin string. If both ends of that guitar string are very tight, pulled strongly in both directions, the guitar string is very stressed, very tight. If something drops on it, it makes a high pitch ping as you lessen the tension, reducing the stress by not putting so hard on either end. The guitar string is much looser. You touch it and it makes a low pitch sound. And if you loosen both ends, until there's no tightness, no stress on the string at all. When something hits it, it makes no sound. When your mind is relaxed, things happen and they let go of them straight away, automatically. There's no tension, there's no tightness, there's no stress.
who are peaceful, free, and easy. When you are relaxed and peaceful in this moment, you find you don't need to, to think. You don't need to run off into the past or worry about the future. Because the present moment is more than satisfying. Just be. And enjoy the peace of not having to go anywhere, not having to do anything, and not being judged. As you relax, the body becomes still, the mind becomes still. You don't make it still, you let it be still. It's so beautiful. A mind at peace, a body relaxed. I'm going to be quiet for the next five minutes to let you enjoy the silence. And when I begin speaking again, it'll be just a couple of minutes before the end of the meditation.
do you feel right now? What's happening? Are you at peace? Are you relaxed? If so, why? What worked and what didn't work? Again, mindfulness gives you feedback. It allows you to learn. The art of relaxation. The ability to let go and be still. Enjoy this moment. Now you may observe your breathing. In, out, in, out, in, out for three times. At the end of the third breath, you can open your eyes to end the meditation. When you finish, you can open your eyes. Please smile. Other people have to look at you. This must get set. If you ain't, we just smile. So there we go. A nice little bit of meditation. Chilling out. So, now the advertised talk. Hey, I was, I've been trying to call it a path with a law. But apparently this is Manchester, so it's a path with a lap. <laughs> but first of all, to introduce myself, that I am a monk, not of the, there's supposed to be three uh, types of Buddhism, traditionally. The first is called the Hinayana, the second is the Mahayana, and the first is the Vajrayana, the Tibet tradition. And I try, like, you know, modern times. Oh, uh -oh time someone's trying to get in. Hi, come in. The door of my heart. That's Caroline, yeah. So I try to um, combine everything. After all, this is the Unitarian, Unitarian Church. You combine things. So my tradition, combining those three major parts of Buddhism, I take the H from Hinayana, the Aha from Mahayana, and the Yana from Vajrayana. And what does that spell? Hahayana. <laughs> Thank you. So I am, I am following the tradition of the Hahayana. <laughs> In other words, a happy path. Because when I became a Buddhist as a young man, and when I went to see the many different traditions, especially when I wanted to become a, become a monk, you know why I became a monk? Because I had a girlfriend, and she, she dumped me. <laughs> and I became, I became a monk to forget. <laughs> Do you believe that? No. Yeah, good, good, good person. Totally false. <laughs> but it could be true because I forgot. <laughs> so, so when I I became a monk because I heard that you can become a monk or a nun just temporarily, just to give it a try to see how it feels. So what I did. I went off to Thailand, told all my friends to be back in a, in a couple of years. What I wanted to do, just go off, get in line, you know, get it out of the way, and then come back and get married. That's what I thought. Until you found out just what a happy path this was. You know the monk I chose to study under was a monk called Ajahn Chah. And one of the reasons it was so attractive studying under such a monk, because you know, I was English monk. His main charm meant tea. <laughs> there was an affinity there. <laughs> and a <the> charm. <laughs> but also, he was a very happy person. 
And I often thought, if any spirituality, if any path was worth anything, I wanted to see the end result. And the end result, if it was somebody who was miserable, and angry, and depressed, I didn't want to be like that. I want to see somebody I wanted to be like. And in fact, I was saying this to, who was it, sometime earlier, that I had two um, people in my early life who were my inspiration on the spiritual path. You know, the two people I wanted to model myself after, you know, in religion. You know who those two people were? It was Friar Tuck from Robin Hood. <laughs> He was always kind and gentle. He wasn't pretentious. Always really kind and helpful and jolly. And the other one was, was um, Father Christmas. <laughs> so happy, so generous. <laughs> Those are the religious people I liked. They didn't create wars. They didn't tell people they're going to go to hell. They just taught people how to be in the present moment, to be kind, to be generous, to be able to be mentally healthy which was really, really important. And so those people I saw who were miseries, they were the ones I thought, no, no, I don't want to be like that. And on the subject of, you now when some people see me, they say, oh, Jen Brown, you're putting on weight. <laughs> and I'll make this up very clear to you, this is not fat. <laughs> I've been a monk now for 43 years. Every year you are a monk, one of the most important things you practice is compassion, kindness. Every year my heart gets a little bit bigger. <laughs> Many years ago it got so big it pressed against my ribcage, couldn't go any further, so it went down and out. This, this is not fat, this is just a big heart. <laughs> That's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> but it is true. Have you ever noticed that, that um, big people are jolly? Skinny people are usually quite mean. <laughs> now check it out. All those politicians who create problems in this world, they're all skinny. The fat politicians, they're the ones, the happy ones, the jolly ones, the kind ones. <laughs> so I always say, but it's that politicians, but especially in religion, you should never ever trust a skinny monk. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, there's something about that happiness, that joy, which shows that, yeah, no matter what's happening in this world, what's happening to you, you can always have this wonderful sense of letting go, just a bit of detachment, a bit of disengagement, so you don't take things so seriously. Even the serious stuff, you can laugh with. Because the most important problem of life, the stuff which really kills you, that gives you bad health, and also an early death and anxiety and depression, is the negativity we have about life. Yeah, for a good example of a positive attitude and a negative attitude. Now I get a lot of my wisdom from the Buddhist text, but also from what I call the only thing which I ever really read in the newspapers is the cartoons. The cartoons are a great source of deep wisdom. One of my favourite recent cartoons was, well first of all, there was a cartoon which I saw of a squirrel at the psychiatrist's office. The squirrel was on the couch and, the, <laughs> and this guy, the psychologist, the psychiatrist, all the, the certificates on the wall, said, what are you doing here? And the squirrel replied, well, ever since I realised you are what you eat, I realised I was nuts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but even though people say it's bad, I've seen this, they can't wait to tell their friends afterwards <laughs> the next terrible joke. 
It's true, you know. <laughs> so the card too, which I also got, which I thought was very, very uh, deep, was from the Peanuts cartoons. And there was Charlie Brown and Snoopy. And Charlie Brown was, was philosophizing. He said, you know, Snoopy, one day we must all die. Now you can't argue with that, can you? Yes, you can. Because the dog, who's always much wiser than human beings, Look at you guys, it's like you have to work, stress out, worry about where you sleep, worry about your food. What do dogs do? They don't have to get to work on a Monday morning. They just sleep around all day. All they ever do is to take you for a walk in the morning. <laughs> That's the only job in life. And they always sleep all day. But anyway, this wise dog, this wise dog, Snoopy, said, yeah, it's true. One day we will all die, but also remember, most days you don't die. <laughs> they can see this, both the truth, but one leads a lot of anxiety, and the other one leads this positive mind. Most days you don't die. So make use of this moment, this day, while you have it. You don't worry too much. There's the anxiety, the fear, that is what creates the lack of happiness in this world. Now, other serious stuff that, oh, I'm trying to be serious, but it won't last. <laughs> <laughs> there was, I used to go off to the, um, the local cancer group in Australia. And I've been going there apparently for 27 years in a row. I always go there every year. And I asked them, why do they keep inviting me to go? And they told me that the first time I went there, there was one lady, she'd had breast cancer, she was had it, so the, the mastectomy, the chemotherapy, the radiation therapy, it's very unpleasant. But she was in remission. But she was so anxious because she kept on worrying what would happen if it came back. What would happen if it came back? Because, you know, in her mind she couldn't face you know, the, the long, very uncomfortable, even painful treatment again. So she was worrying so much and all of the psychologists, the doctors, as even the psychiatrists couldn't fix the problem. And here came in this, this weirdo with a bald head and a brown robe into their place to teach them some meditation and she put her hand up to ask that question she said I'm concerned, I've had a mastectomy all the treatment, I'm in remission now but what would happen if it came back? You know what I said? What would happen if it didn't come back? And she got it straight away changing the negative attitude towards a positive attitude You know what happened? It never came back. But she comes back every year for the past 26 years to say thank you. <laughs> now that's that the positive attitude, which is, it is joyful, it's fun, it's not negative, negative. It doesn't make fear, it makes something else. The beautiful, like, positive attitude in life, which is what the laughter actually does. It doesn't take life so seriously that you go worrying about things so much. You know that uh, that path with the heart, so simple, so much fun. Uh, let's see, what have I got for here? I still have to do for my, my uh, visual aids today. That I remember, sort of, this is Buddhism, which is so easy, which is fun. My master, he just one day stopped and he said, it was a stick. This is like a cap, I've got a stick here, but he said, this stick, is it heavy? And before I could answer, He'd thrown it away. And he said, it's only... Did I hit anybody, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> I need it, I need it, I need it, I need it. Please don't sue me. Actually, sue her, she organises. <laughs> he, said, he said, it's only heavy when you keep holding it. When you throw it away, when you let it go, it's not heavy anymore. 
for the only one who's really worried about what might happen. Anybody who is, has got some terrible things you're still holding on to, of course it's heavy when you hold on to it, but if you can throw it away, let it go, it's not heavy anymore. But each one of us has done some terrible things in the past. Be careful, because some monks and nuns can read your mind. <laughs> Do not be afraid, because if you can read somebody's mind, you read it once or twice, you never want to read a mind ever again. <laughs> it's like a bad novel, badly written, with no real coherent storyline. <laughs> You don't need to worry at all. Basically, your mind's not worth reading. <laughs> <laughs> so, but we've all done things in the past. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. Oh, people have done stuff to you. They shouldn't have done. So how can you let that go with a bit of happiness and a laugh? So I invented this method, which when I told some of the in a psychiatry conference over in Sydney. Had everybody writing it down. It was really good and it's actually probably used in many, many psychiatrists' offices. But here you get it for free. I'm undercutting the market. <laughs> Putting many psychiatrists out of a job. So anyway, what you do, so they can focus on, on treating squirrels instead of you guys. Squirrels, because they're nuts, because that's what they eat. So anyway, <laughs> what I did, I said, it's standard practice that if you want to let go, be free and be happy, what you need to do first of all is actually to acknowledge, bring it up. But one of the best ways of bringing up the past is actually writing it down. Standard practice, write it down on a piece of paper. But my method is original in the type of paper you use and the colour of the ink which you write it down on. Because if you want to write down some of the stuff you've done in the past which is really hurting you, it's hard to let go of, you have to write it down on toilet paper <laughs> and use brown ink, dark brown ink. <laughs> Because what happens when you write it down, all this terrible stuff which you've done, or all these, these really cruel, mean, un, unkind things which have happened to you, you write it down on toilet paper in brown ink. <coughs> you make what we call in psychology association <laughs> with the other stuff which goes on <laughs> toilet paper, which is brown. So you write it down. Now, this is funny, but it's also, it works. In brown ink, on toilet paper, it's very cheap toilet paper, a whole roll. Maybe you get two rolls for all the stuff which happened to you. But you write it down on brown ink, you make an association be with the other stuff which is brown, which goes on toilet paper. Now, first of all, why do you keep that stuff? All those bad memories, on those te why can't you let it go? And it's like, I don't know if any of you are really uh, caring for the earth and the environment and worried about things like climate change and, and all of the deforestation. Do you really care about that? Yeah. Well, how many of you use both sides of the toilet paper? <laughs> <laughs> You're wasting stuff! <laughs> You know, sometimes you wipe your bum and it's only a tiny bit of brown on it. Can't you just fold it up, put it in your pocket and leave it for the next one? <laughs> Instead of wasting stuff? No. Nobody, even the head of Greenpeace does that. Even a tiny bit of brown stuff on toilet paper and you have to throw it away, discard it. So there's a very deep association there. Anything which is brown on toilet paper, you should not keep. It's not the sort of stuff 
Please excuse me, it is shit. <laughs> and you should keep that stuff. So what do you do? You go to do the letting go ceremony. <laughs> and you don't need a Buddhist temple or a church or an expensive psychiatrist couch to do that. You go into the toilet. Into the WC, into the restroom, whatever you call it. And you go in there, but you don't put it in the bowl yet. You've got to read it out once more to reinforce that this is not the sort of stuff and memories that you should be folding up and putting in your pocket. You read it out again, and then you do the ceremony, the letting go ceremony. You put it in the bowl. And you can do some chanting if you like, but then you press the lovely button on the top. And all those bad memories go down the bend, out of your life, hopefully, forever. Sometimes you have to do that two or three times. But it's a ceremony which is fun, but it also actually works. But please don't do it in the toilets of this building here, otherwise they'll all be clogged up and they're never going to see it here again. But at your home, whatever, it actually works because it's an association, a ceremony, which is a letting go ceremony and it is the humour, the fun of it, makes you remember what is happening. And that is why the humour becomes a powerful method of remembering you know, what you've been advised or taught. Because you know sometimes, sometimes I give all these talks and people are listening and they're enjoying it and then afterwards I ask them, well, what did I say? Um, I don't know, but it was deep. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> but the thing with teaching, what's the point? unless people actually improve, become better human beings afterwards. And so we use humour as a way of emphasising the teachings, emphasising just, you know, just how to live a happier life. Now, I notice a couple of, a few couples here. So, one of the things which I enjoy doing is, uh, again, marriage blessings. Do a lot of those. And, when you do a marriage blessing, have great fun, a little bit of fun and games, but also something which solves a lot of problems in their life. So there's two stories which I always tell for people who are married. The first one is the story of these couple who had just been recently married and in the afternoon after lunch they went for a walk in the park. And as they were walking, enjoying the nice warm afternoon in the park, they heard a sound. Quack, quack. Quack, quack. And straight away, the wife, the woman, said, Oh, darling, can you hear that? That's a chicken. He said, what? It's a chicken. Went quack, quack again. It's a chicken. She said, no, darling, darling. That was a duck. That wasn't a chicken. That was a duck. She said, no, 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 that was a chicken. And he said, no, it was a duck. She said, it was a chicken. He said, it's a duck. She said, a chicken. He said, a duck. She said, it was a chicken. <laughs> before, before she burst out crying, he paused. He remembered why he married her and what was really important. He squeezed her hand gently, looked in her eyes which were about to burst into tears, and said, Darling, I think you may be right. <laughs> that is a chicken. And she said, oh, Thank you, darling. And it went quack quack again. <laughs> but that they carried on walking. And that night he got a hot dinner. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> because the moral of that story, who cares whether it's a chicken or a duck? Is that worth having a divorce over? Or having no dinner and no one talking to you? It's not worth it, is it? What's really important in a relationship? Just a love and peace. And you find that people do argue over the most smallest things. And number two, just, just because it goes quack quack does not mean that it's a duck. In Australia, I say that could have been, that could have been a chicken who flew over Fukushima nuclear disaster zone. <laughs> It could be a, if it's the UK, it was probably a chicken from Chernobyl, which goes quack quack now, mutating. <laughs> but truthfully, I told that story many times, and someone did send me an article from some magazine or the internet somewhere, and there is at least one chicken which goes quack quack. <laughs> there was an orphan little chicken whose mother had died or they lost their family, and it was, was adopted by a duck. It's a chicken, but actually goes quack quack. So it could be that chicken. So just because it doesn't, you know, it's really unreasonable that chickens go quack quack, I have proof that there is at least one that does go quack quack. So, don't have an argument. It's not worth it. So if ever you have a with your friend or your partner, you can't have an argument. And uh, he says, oh, it's this way. Said, no, it can't be. Stop arguing and just one of you go quack, quack. <laughs> and that's the end of the argument. They realise it's not worth arguing over. And number two. Number two. I'm trying to tell that story to Kim Jong-un and Mr. Trump. Mm -hmm. Right, he's the time. He's right, he's right. It's not very really important, is it? It's more important they don't destroy the earth. Mm -hmm. But anyway, one day I'll get to see them. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Who knows? But I don't know, I was told yesterday, last night, did you hear the news about the assassination attempt against Donald Trump? You haven't heard that? No, this is, this is one of his meetings, somebody pulled a gun, and pointed at, at uh, the president, but one of the security guards shouted out, Donald, duck! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> And the assassin couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> they could pull the trigger. That didn't happen, by the way, so anyway. <laughs> but the other story is told for, for married couples is deeper, but it's really powerful. And that was whenever I do a, a marriage blessing. Look at the husband and wife. Look at them in the eye. This is the big day of their life. They're committing to one another. You know the difference between just going out together, just, we call that involvement. But once you're married, we call it commitment. Once you've got that second ring on, it's commitment. And to impress on, upon the point, the difference between involvement and commitment is the same as the difference between bacon and eggs. Understand? Oh, come on, in bacon and eggs, the chicken is only involved. The pig is committed. <laughs> <laughs> the pig gets his own life. Chicken just walks away. That's what we call commitment. So if you ever get married, remember it's a pig of a marriage. You're not a chicken of a marriage. You give everything. You don't hold anything back. So you talk to these two people, just married. I looked them in the eye. And the first one I said, Now you are a married woman. You must never think of yourself from this time on. And look at the partner. Now you are a married man and not a married woman. You must never think of yourself either. You know they always not. They can understand that. Because in marriage you should never be selfish, think of yourself. I'm still thinking of, of the second partner. Looked them in the eye and said, you must never think of yourself, and you must never think of her like your partner. Look at the partner and say, you must never think of him, your husband. That's wonderful. Because people, again, haven't got a clue what I'm talking about. <laughs> who is this crazy person who's marrying us? I don't know why actually you get priests to marry you. 
especially in Bhakti Gita. I've never been married, what do I know? <laughs> but anyway, so once you're married you must never think of yourself. You must never ever think of your partner. Once you're married, you must only think of us. The third option! It's not about me. It's not about her or him. It's about us. So once you understand that, if you have a problem, whose problem is it? Our problem. It's not the European Union's problem. It's not Britain's problem. Whose problem is it? Our problem. Always will be. So, it's amazing when it's always our problem, it's always a solution. When it's somebody else's fault, you'll never find a solution. I was always told by my master, keeping it simple, if, if you've got an itch on your head and you scratch your bum, the itch never goes away. In fact, you get an extra itch where at first you only have one. That's actually blaming others for your problem. You have one itch, so if you've got an itch on your head, please don't scratch, scratch your bum, scratch, your, <laughs> scratch your, your, your head. So, we take responsibility for things, instead of blaming others. So, these are little teachings which actually work. We're in it together, so we help one another. We find a solution to the problems of life together. There's been some people from Sri Lanka here, from other Asian countries. I've been many years in Asia. In fact, I spent all my, all my life in Asia because I, I am a Caucasian. I'm an Asian. I'm an Asian. Caucasian. <laughs> <laughs> all Asian. But anyway, in Asia, Asia, they always have this simile once you're married, or actually before you're married, you're like a two-legged animal, you can go whichever way you want. But once you're married, you are like a four-legged animal with one body. So the four legs have to go in the same direction. Otherwise you fall over and can't go anywhere. And according to the Asian culture, in Asian culture, the front legs of the elephant have to be the man and the back two legs have to be the woman. But in Asia, especially in Sri Lanka, the elephant always walks backwards. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that true? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Is that true? Yeah, yeah, we got it. <laughs> so, but when it gets like uh, just with like ethics and even like forgiveness, letting go of the past and not being anxious about the future. You know sometimes people always say, oh there's lots to worry about. What will happen after Brexit? What will happen if there's a nuclear war? What will happen if I get cancer? What will happen if there's another terrorist attack? What will happen? And that's always the same as that cancer patient. What would happen if it didn't? I was invited to Singapore many years ago to give a series of talks in a big convention centre. They booked this four nights in a row, I uh, think a capacity 4,000 people in the convention centre. Just me giving the talk. And in fact that was the time when to advertise the talk, they put posters on the back of the buses in Singapore. For once it was true, I had a face like the back of a bus. <laughs> <laughs> it was true, I have photographed of it. <laughs> it's on the back of a bus. Quite a few buses. But that was a time of the SARS crisis. Remember the sudden acute respiratory syndrome? And at that time in Asia, it was a really big health crisis. And as I flew into Singapore, I read on the Singapore paper, 
in big black letters, 99 people had contracted SARS. And the government had shut down all the schools. And they had asked people to have no public gatherings. It was a health crisis. And as soon as I arrived at the airport, that all the people who spent so much money and time advertising the talks, they said, what should we do? This is a disaster, a crisis. Should we cancel? You know what my answer was? I said, how many people live in Singapore? About four million. I said, how many people have got SARS? 99. So, there's a three, so that means 3,999,901 people haven't got SARS. So we have a 30,000 to 1 chance of no one getting SARS on my talks. Let's go ahead. Why is it? The odds are in your favour. 99, only 99 have got SARS and anyway, what is SARS anyway? It's acute respiratory uh, syndrome. And what's the best way of, of um, uh, strengthening your lungs so you don't get that disease? No. Exercising your lungs. So I made a big point of making many, many jokes. So that people laugh so much, their lungs got so strong. <laughs> and when you laugh, you get so much happiness. I think endorphins, whatever called nature's immune um, enhancers, it worked. So that's my response. Why is it that people have so much fear? What about life? Now I travel so much on aircraft and people are always concerned about bombs going off in the aircraft. You know, the latest one was on laptops. And so so, there's this guy, underpack bomber. I mean, that was really stupid. And went off in his underpacks. <laughs> that guy was really crazy. That's instant car, that was sick. Yeah, you're a man. <laughs> really painful. <laughs> but, look, some people said, well, how can you protect against this? And so, when people said, aren't you afraid of dying in an aircraft explosion at 36,000 feet? I said, no, of course not. Because, I said, there are three advantages of dying in an aircraft explosion at 36,000 feet. Advantages. Benefits. See the positive side. What are those benefits? Number one, instant cremation for free. <laughs> How many of you have had to book a funeral director in Manchester and wait for a few weeks and have to pay all this money, you know, for a funeral. And there, 36,000 feet, it's done on the spot. No worries, no problems, don't have to take time off work. All done for you. And not only that, they scatter the ashes too. <laughs> Number two. How expensive are funerals these days? You, know, you say they cost an arm and leg, actually they cost the whole body. But, they cost a lot. So, this is not only done gratis, pro bono, for free, but you also, the family, get money from that. The aircraft actually <laughs> pays out. You end up in profit. And it's very difficult quite actually time. You know, anything helps. Anything helps. So that's the second, second benefit. No financial hardship on the family. Uh, but the third benefit is the best. If you die, an aircraft explosion at 36,000 feet. You're so close to heaven, it's easy to go the rest of the way. <laughs> it's looking at a positive side of life. So why worry about these things? So, I g gave a series of talks some time ago called Happy Every Day. And straight away people said, what about the night? Said, okay, well, that means the night time as well. Happy every day, happy every night. They said, how can you do that? How can you be happy when you lose your job? 
How can you be happy when you get sick? How can you be happy when there's tragedies in this world? How can you be happy? And the answer was that if you are miserable, if you are grumpy, be happy to be grumpy. Be happy to be miserable. Be happy to be depressed. It's part of life. What's wrong with being sick? What's wrong with being tired? What's wrong with being grumpy? Because I was teaching a retreat in Perth a few years ago and this girl came, or this young Indonesian girl she said, I feel so guilty, I feel so hopeless I'm supposed to be happy but I feel grumpy and miserable and everybody else is smiling at me and I can't smile back, it makes me even more sick to see everyone else happy but not me. <coughs> Can you please ask people not to smile at me? I feel miserable. I feel grumpy and I feel such a failure you know, meditating and not being happy. So you know what I did? I quickly went into my room, turned on the computer and typed up the first grumpy license. <laughs> it was on our monastery letterhead and it, <laughs> it read something like grumpy license. This license grants to, and I put her name down, Veronica, permission to be miserable at any time for any reason or no reason in particular for the rest of her life, signed her teacher Ajahn Brahm. And I signed it and dated it. So I gave her permission to be grumpy. And as soon as I gave that grumpy license to her, she was smiling <laughs> <laughs> That's how we're happy every day. In all other words, to be happy, to be miserable. Then there's no problem anymore. But the problem is, I'm miserable, I should not be miserable. It's wrong, there's something wrong with me and I'm miserable. There's nothing wrong with being miserable. There's nothing wrong with being sick. For goodness sake, how many people here in this room have never been sick in their life? Anyone? Can be honest. So you've all been sick, okay? Fair assumption. So if all of you have been sick, then it's quite normal to be sick. It's usual to be sick. In fact, it will be really odd, weird, if you've never been sick. In fact, it will be so weird if the NHS found out you've never been sick. They would be have you in the lab doing tests finding out what the heck is going on. You'll be so abnormal, they would say there's something wrong with you, you're always healthy. <laughs> so when you realise it's okay to be sick, it's right to be sick, then all the people who understand this teaching, whenever they go and see their GP, the doctor in their surgery, would always say, Doctor, there's something right with me again. I'm sick. Stop stigmatizing life. I think you must always be healthy. You must always be right. You must always be, I don't know what you're supposed to be. But if you give permission for your husband to be grumpy, give him a grumpy license. <laughs> then he's not so grumpy anymore. Give your wife <laughs> permission to, to, to shop more. I hereby give you a shopping permit. Then she won't shop so much. Do you reckon? That's a money back guarantee. If it doesn't work, you can ask me for my money back. Or your money back. Because you didn't pay any money, so I've got nothing to lose. But even my books, <coughs> any book I write, it always comes with a money back guarantee. If you don't like the book, you may always ask for your money back. Guarantee, honest, you heard that. It's recorded. You can always ask for your money back. You won't get it back. <laughs> <laughs> you are allowed to ask. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there's nothing wrong with being sick. It takes the stigma, to, uh, the, the stigma away from sickness. Which means a lot of time that you know, people actually go and, and report to doctor earlier. 
you know, they feel a bit sick or they feel a bit tired or depressed or you know, heart attacks or whatever because you're not stigmatizing it. It's okay, there's nothing wrong with it. So you're happy to be sick. The only trouble with sickness though, it would be wonderful to be sick. You can lay down and have a nice rest and people care for you and they give you your special foods and stuff like that. If you didn't feel so bad, you know, sickness would be actually quite good. So I always tell people, as soon as you recover from your sickness, you start feeling good. Don't let on. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. <laughs> Enjoy the time off as much as you possibly can. <laughs> now, so, a lot of life is about uh, happiness, and happiness is good for your health. Oh, uh, well, I've got plenty of time. One of the get favorite, favorite stories I have is just on the other side of the, of the hills, uh, over in... Oh no, sorry, he was actually from Lancashire, in a place called Chester the Street. You know where that is? That way a bit. And he was like a Lancashire man, but you know, in the olden days, you know, most people used to, to, um, to uh, smoke, so eventually he got lung cancer. So they had all the treatments, but eventually you know, he was put in a hospice. You know, basically just you know, a departure lounge. So there he was, and I went to visit him, and he told me the story. He said, the first night at the hospice, it was just like to keep you comfortable, not even trying to actually have any recovery, just make it pain-free as best as possible, only for the last few days of his life. He's on the way out. So the nurse came up to him and said, Ted, now what do you want for dinner tonight? He said, oh, crikey. You know, I've got high cholesterol, so I can't have anything sort of oil of this. I've got hard blood vessels, nothing salty. I've got diabetes, so I can't have anything sugary. And the nurse looked at him, Ted, what on earth are you talking about? The cholesterol's not going to kill you. The hardened arteries, they're not going to matter at all, nor the diabetes. You're going to die in a few days of cancer. You can eat whatever you want. And he's like, really? <laughs> so all the foods his wife had banned him from eating for the last three or four years, all his favourite foods which he missed, he ordered and started eating. And this is no exaggeration, after another few days, he got so healthy, he walked out of that hospital and had another six months of life. And after that six months, he went back to the hospital to die properly. But, and after six months, because of the joy, and the happiness, and the lack of fear. I think it was, I, I was arguing with my brother about this, but it was, I thought it was a pretty short change here, that man does not live by bread alone. That, doesn't, that means by food alone. Something else just keeps you going. The general happiness. So a happy path, sorry, a happy path, <laughs> a pack of whack. <laughs> <laughs> that is healthy for you. I noticed this. People always. I was a, I was a theoretical physicist before, over at Cambridge. And there was uh, many of the scientists keep uh, giving me really interesting uh, papers. And one of those papers was it has been totally proven, without a shadow of doubt, when you're happy and when you laugh. Your, your blood vessels actually expand, they get bigger. But when you're negative, anxious, fed up, miserable, bleh, your, your blood vessels actually contract, they get smaller. So, you know, you know I just laugh a lot, have a good time as a monk. I'm a good time monk. I'm <laughs> <laughs> a good time. I keep all my rules and precepts. I have a good time. Why not? So when you have the happiness, you develop that happy path, a path of a laugh, then what happens is your, your blood vessels actually get bigger. So what that also means, it's like it becomes a, a super highway, like a multi-lane uh, freeway or motorway. It gets so big and so wide, there's never a traffic jam. So you can eat whatever you like, any gut goes through there and it never clogs up because your blood vessels are so wide. And that answered a very important question in life. 
why are all fat people happy? The reason is jolly. The only reason is because all fat, miserable people died a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> if you're fat and happy, there's the extra gut which has to go through your system. It's got a wider blood vessel to go through. So if you are overweight, you better start laughing quick. <laughs> Otherwise you suck. And that's actually so true. Why is that? And even if you're thin, start laughing and you find the, the, uh, the blood vessels don't contract. Which means you don't get strokes and heart attacks. The laughter is good medicine. And if this is physical health, but especially mental health, for the mental health, as well as the physical health, the laughter, the happiness, does see the positive side of life, and all the negativity which causes our modern world with so much more cancer, mental health issues, even with mental health issues. I mean, I suppose it would be Mental Health Week this week, it was over in Australia, I think, World Mental Health Week. Mental health is a huge social problem in our modern world. Why? Well, is it because it's always been there but not recognised or not treated? Or is it a modern phenomenon? And I think it is. There's a lot to say. It is a modern phenomenon because people worry too much. And they don't know how just to take time off, rest and relax. And just enjoy the moment. There's so much happiness out there, we don't see it because we're running too fast. A serious story, sort of. Where I live in Australia is on top of a hill. We chose that place to build a monastery about 33 years ago out of tradition. We had to choose the top of a hill because Holy men live on top of mountains. You never hear of a holy man or woman living in a swamp. With one exception. Yoga. <laughs> but that's, that's Hollywood, that's Star Wars, that's not... That's, is it Star Wars? Yeah. But that's not, you know, reality. Reality, you have to live on top of a hill. So, we, we got a place on top of the hill, not a big hill, but it's all we could get, all we could afford. So please, don't get a nun's monastery in a swamp. <coughs> have to be on the top of a hill or more somewhere. So, so it was on top of a hill. And for seven years, I've been up and down that hill, maybe two, three, four times a week, in a car. But one day, I was early, it was a beautiful spring day, not too hot, not too cold. And I asked the driver, I want to walk up that hill today. They let me out of the boat. It was only about an hour's walk, not that far. Nice, comfortable walk. And as I started walking up that hillside, it was strange, it was weird. I could not remember that hillside. It looked totally different than anything I could recognize. I thought, what is happening when I've been up and down that hill for seven years in a car and now I can't recognize it at all. It was so striking, so strange, that I stopped and stared in disbelief. <coughs> and as I stopped and stared, the hillside changed again and became more beautiful, seeing more detail, little wild flowers you know, between the grass the rocks in the little stream in the valley below, and all the beautiful bark on the trees. He saw so much more, and it looked more beautiful than I could ever remember seeing through the window of a car. And it was so weird that I started exploring. Why did this happen? And I used my science. Now what is sight anyway? The light goes through your your iris to the back of your eye, the retina, which is a chemical reaction happens. And once that chemical reaction is finished, then it sends the electric pulses to the brain to work out what you've seen. 
But when you look through the window of a car speeding, the light which hits the back of your eye does not have sufficient time to complete the chemical reaction so the detail is not complete and the colours are washed out, they're pastel. Just like in the old days, you know, I'm old enough now, at school we would develop our own photographs. You had a photographic paper in chemicals and very slowly the image would emerge. If you took it out too soon, it wouldn't be complete. So, that was what was happening. When I looked through the window of a speeding car, the images weren't fully complete. And then another image came up, and then another image, and then another image. So, no detail, colours, pastel. But when I stopped, and when I walked, I had more time. The sense of sight, the eyes had more time to have a fuller image, more detail, and the colours were richer. But nothing was as beautiful as when you stopped. And the, the, the eyes had all the time in the world, all the time they needed to, to complete the full development of that chemical reaction on the back of your eye. Only then, when I stopped and gave my sight enough time, could I see everything was in that, that hillside. And all the colours, the greens, the yellows, the browns, the shades were more complete than I'd ever seen before. It was beautiful simply because I'd slowed down and stopped. And I realized this how it was a wonderful simile for life. We go so fast that we like traveling in a speeding car. And even the street where we live, we don't really know it. The persons we meet, even the people we live with, we don't really know. We're moving too fast. So when you slow down, you see so much more, more detail, and what you see becomes more and more delightful. That is one of the reasons why, when we go fast, we can't appreciate the beauty of our surroundings. The slower you go, the more your senses pick up, the more you feel alive the more you see. And I'm going to finish off <coughs> with one of my favourite stories. Gross, but memorable. <laughs> when I was teaching a meditation retreat over in Perth, you know sometimes I get into really deep meditation. But when I came out afterwards, my mind was going so slowly, you could see everything and feel everything and smell everything. The whole world was so rich and powerful, like you were fully alive. But the reason I had to come out of meditation was to go to the toilet. Well, I had to do what they call a number two. You know what number two means, don't you? Yeah. So I went there and sat down and did a number two. And even, you know, good health. You know, same with meditation, you don't force anything. You sit down there and just relax and let go. If you force it, you get piles, hemorrhoids. Same with meditation, with life, if you force it, you screw up your mind. So whatever you do in life, just relax and let go. You know, I learned so much by just sitting on a toilet. <laughs> what I did. I made a big mistake after doing a number two, just relaxing, letting go. I did what I should not have done. I looked at the contents of the toilet bowl. Wow! In all my life, I'd never seen such a beautiful piece of shit. Honestly, just... Have you ever looked at it? Just the way the little balls are stuck together. It was like, like, a, stat, like a sculpture by Rodin or even Michelangelo. You know, I don't know if you have an artistic sense. Have you ever been to art school? 
because it's where the shapes are interacting together. The way that one influences the appreciation of the one next to it. It was actually gorgeous. And the colours, the colours, it wasn't just brown. You can see so much more, it's different shades of brown. And again, there's the way that they interacted together. It was like, it was a work of art. And then, and then, the aroma. Now, honestly, some of the, the perfumes and scents they have these days are so fake and superficial, they're not real. They don't speak of the earth, this nature, this basic stuff of life. And oh, that was just a, like a sense explosion in my nose. And it was so amazing, just this very beautiful, aromatic, <laughs> and I tell people, I honestly, I thought to pick it up and show my friends. <laughs> it was beautiful. <laughs> it was only, it was only because of my training as a monk. Let go. Don't attach. It was a tough one. I've let go so much in my life. Girlfriends, money, property, all this other stuff which I have to let go of. That was one of the hardest acts of renunciation. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you had the button at the top many times, you know, I can't do this. No, but you might, no, no, I don't want to. <laughs> finally I did, finally I did, and I pressed it. And the most beautiful thing I've ever produced disappeared out of my life forever. Maybe I'm still. A bit of grief and <laughs> but no, the most amazing thing was the beauty, the happiness was not inherent in what lay in the bottom of the bowl. Beauty is not in a person or in the sky or in a flower. The happiness is how you look at it. If a piece of shit can be so beautiful, honestly, no exaggeration, imagine like your boss at work, and many people compared to a piece of dumb. <laughs> <laughs> the government, <laughs> whatever, a piece of But if that can be so beautiful, it's just the way you look at it. And so, a path with a laugh, a path with happiness, anything can look beautiful. One of my favourite poets, William Blake, to see a world in a grain of sand, see a heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand, and eternity in an hour. 17th century William Blake. I can relate to that. See a world in a grain of sand. How much is in there when you pause enough to look? A part with great happiness. Enjoy. Even a little flower, a little blade of grass which pokes up through the paving stones <coughs> to see a whole infinity in the palm of your hand, eternity, in a moment. It said hour because hour and hour with flower, moment didn't. But what it meant was just that happiness, a path with a laugh, so happy. You can't resist being light-hearted and laughing. And one last, oh yeah, just about time. One last joke, which I promised I would tell. Q and A. I've already started. Okay, Q and A now. <laughs> Who's going to ask a question? Somebody asked, "What's the joke?" <laughs> yes. I think first of all, thank you very much for coming yeah. to the UK. You're my hero, Monk. Yay! Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, is that because you know you're trying to say yeah. Um, so um, the a path of the laugh appeals to me. Yeah. Um, I spend my time around what are called fun sponges on occasion. Fun sponges. Yeah, moon poopers. 
So, mood hoovers, yeah. yeah. So I'm just interested if you've got any advice on how we go about that. Maybe the oh, yeah. turd comment. Yeah. 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 It's not this one. Don't <laughs> clarify the, the quacking chicken. On Quack, the yeah, okay, yeah, just quack quack. Just remember it's not about her. Not about you. Who is it about? Oh dear. Great, you're together, so enjoy that together. So the path of the laugh of fun sponges is sometimes that, yeah, people take away our, our energy, but they can't take away our happiness. We had, uh, recently, we had a burglary in our monastery. Burglar came in and stole generators, chainsaws, expensive tools. So straight away we found out Somebody says, bad karma, you shouldn't do that. And I said, look, they can, steal our, they can steal our property, but they'll never be able to steal our happiness. That we won't allow anyone to steal. You've got a choice there. Steal your happiness or keep your happiness. It's your choice. No one can do that. And anyway, it was all insured. So when we got the insurance payout, they paid out fully, we could get new tools which were cheaper and much more efficient. It was just like, just we renewed everything, got better quality. So actually, we made a lot out of that. But I was still trying try to find the piece to find out who actually stole that stuff so we can invite them back again. <laughs> 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 so that's actually, so you don't allow people to steal you. It's a negative. They shouldn't do this. Why do they do this? Why do they have to keep asking me questions? Why do they have to keep doing this? Blah, 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 blah. Don't think about it. Just do it. And life is so easy. And lower your expectations. You know your expectations what government should be like. Lower your expectations what your partner should be like. And you lower your expectations of what he should be like. And then you have a happy life. I lowered my expectations a long time ago. And I asked everyone else to lower their expectations of me. Don't always expect me to say new jokes. Which gives me a nice invitation before I answer the next question. To <coughs> so answer my own question, my latest joke. So here it comes, and that was, was it's a Buddhist joke about, you know, you know Buddhists believe in, in many lives, reincarnation. So this person, they had a dream that there were a piece of ravioli, a piece of ravioli. And the next night they had another dream, there were a piece of spaghetti. They're an Italian Buddhist, I worked it out, they were recollecting their past lives. Oh, come on! So how many of you? <laughs> <Hey, laughs> yeah, it is. But you are all going to tell your friends or someone. <laughs> as soon as you possibly can. <laughs> yes, come on. What's about regrets? Regrets. If you regret, you can't change the past, and you can't learn from the past either. You learn from the present, not the past. If you try to regret the past, you look back upon the past. And you think, well, why did that happen to me? I say it's like treading in the dog shit if you go home tonight, this afternoon. What should you do if you get dog poo all over your shoes? For goodness sake, do not scrape it off yet. Always take the dog shit home with you. And then scrape it off under your garden. Maybe under an apple tree. If you scrape it off under an apple tree, the next autumn, when you eat that apple from your apple tree, it will be juicier and sweeter than ever before. And as you are biting into that juicy sweet apple, and all the juice is dripping down both of you, you must always remember, please remember what you're eating. You're eating dog shit. That's where it came from. Being transformed into juicy apple. That's how we do not regrets. We dig it in. We create more compassion and happiness and wisdom in our life. No regrets. Please give me more dog shit. <laughs> okay, yeah. You said about earlier on about throwing things away that no longer served you. Yeah. And, and your memories and being able to kind of let go of things. Mm. But surely um, if the memories or the letting 
ago is of a maybe more severe magnitude. Like some people have been extremely trauma, traumatized. It's, if we all just let it go, we'd all be sure we're doing that. Oh, it's great if we do, can do that. Real story, this is not really laughter serious. There was, in Malaysia once, there's one girl, they asked me to talk with her, uh, like a last resort. I don't cost anything, so <coughs> it's pretty uh, good value for money. So I just listened to her, and she'd been very violently raped. Really bad, badly. And you know, sometimes it just makes your skin crawl that one human being could do such a bad thing to another person. But I knew that other counsellors, psycho psychiatrists, psychologists, had never been able to help her. You had to think outside the box. And one thing which I learned, never allow your learning to stand in the way of truth. All the things you're supposed to do, all your knowledge, you've got to see something further, something deeper. So I was just being so peaceful, so, so accepting. And when she stopped talking, describing this terrible thing, you know what came out of my mouth? It shocked me more than it shocked even her. It will shock, it will shock you. And what I said was, you are so lucky to have been raped like that. So lucky to have been raped like that. I couldn't believe what I said. I just, I, no premeditating, not thinking, just allow it to come out. And then I thought, what did I say? Why did I say it? And then I told her, I said, I can never understand or appreciate what it must have been like and the pain you're feeling now. I can never put my hand around you and say, I know how you feel. I'll never be able to do that. But I say that you will be able to be with someone who's experienced something like that in the future you'll be able to understand what I can never appreciate. You'll be able to put your hand around another person and say, I really know how you feel. <coughs> and you will know the way out of that dark hole. That is why I said you are lucky, because that is your meaning in your life. You'll find a way out of this. I don't know how. I can't really help you. I can say what you can do with it. In the two years, three years, you'll be able to help so many people in a way which I can never do. That's your meaning. And that really sort of shook her as it shook me. You can't pretend to do that. You can't figure it out first of all. You can say that. Yeah, so it's meaning. Here it is, it's shit. Dig it in. It's a purpose there, a meaning. She did it. Good on her. And the other thing which I did, and it's still being used, that there's a, a group of society in Australia, they are, it's called ASSETS, the Australian Society of Survivors of Torture and Trauma. And now these are refugees who come to you know, places like Australia, Canada, UK, US. You know, real refugees. And their bodies are free, but their minds, their emotions, are still in those torture chambers, underground dungeons, where they wonder how they could ever survive, what, how they were treated. There are young women who have been raped and raped and raped and raped, just for no reason. And they've managed to pull through, physically, but emotionally, they're traumatized. How do you free them from that? And so it was a simile which I said, I got it from my father, who was from Liverpool. It was that when I was only about 13, about 13, 14, he pulled aside in his car and he just gave me this beautiful piece of father to son advice, saying, son, wherever you go in your life, whatever happens, the door of my house will always be open to you. That one, yeah. And I realized it wasn't his house, it was his heart. It was unconditional love. But the simile of open the door of your heart. So I taught this in this group, Assets. That when a victim of trauma, really bad trauma, feels they're safe, they're ready to do this, 
in a quiet, calm, secure place. They imagine their heart. Not like a, a, a doctor's heart, but just like the Valentine's Day heart, nice and simple. You know, they, and then you imagine, has two doors open up, like these two doors here, they open up. And when they open up, there's you, inside the heart, the part of you which you feel comfortable with. The happy you, the peaceful you, the successful you. But then, down at the bottom, is all the little girls who were so badly treated, rejected, tortured, raped. We keep them all outside. Outside. And that's you. And you can't keep them outside. And you imagine a staircase going out to the ground. And the part of you which you are sort of comfortable with, you say the other parts of you, come up, come inside. You're part of me as well. And you imagine this terrified little memories of your past, so badly hurt and rejected, so unloved, cold, just walking up, so scared, and you keep encouraging them every step, come on. And when they get to the top, you're part of me. I will never reject you ever again. You're part of me. And every one of those comes inside. They become part of you. That's a catharsis. <coughs> Trying to get rid of them. That's what causes just the pain and the trauma to keep on going. The rejection, the lack of self-worth. So you can't be in the way, you have to embrace them. Then. Embrace and get them in. And it's brilliant. It works. And you see some of these people afterwards. And they say, people say, that's terrible. What, what happened to you? And they just turn, it was not terrible. You, you can't say that, you have no idea. That's who I am. And I'm at peace with that. And there, oh, that moves me, because I've never been tortured or traumatized or raped. I don't know how it feels. But, you know, you can go 1% of the way in empathy, but at least you get the way out. And it's beautiful. And I taught that years ago, and apparently it's on the big wall there, just a therapy which works for people with torture and trauma. So they're free, not just physically, but emotionally as well. That's not a, it's not just a path with a laugh. It's not superficial, but wow, that stuff really moves me. Hopefully it moves you as well. It's a different way of looking at stuff. I know somebody said, Oh, you know, you make Buddhism a little bit different than I expected, of course. Spirituality, religion, should always be rebellious. Seeing things in a different way. Standing up for giving you a hope. Positive hope. Which actually can take people out of pain and suffering and misery and rejection. Feeling that they're, they're diminished because of their past. Taking away the stigma from people. And it's beautiful when that happens. People are free. Wow. You know the greatest thing is, it doesn't cost any money. You go to a, <laughs> a psychiatrist or a psychologist and a therapist, it costs a huge amount of money. So I say, I really enjoy undercutting the market. <laughs> giving stuff for free. So please share that around. It's really powerful. Any of you work in that area, just go for it. One of the things is I'm not afraid of saying the wrong thing because, you know, if you're a professional you might get banned and barred from the profession. But being a monk, many of you know I stood up for monk, nuns ordinations, equity with women, I got expelled from the monastery. But you can only be excommunicated once in your life, so now I can do whatever I want. <laughs> I'm not really excommunicated, but, you know, being a rebel gives you a lot of freedom. But it's not just being rebellious. As you know that you know, there's many Sri Lankans here. And very well accepted in, in Sri Lanka. And also in Thailand and other countries. You know, you are using your authority. And I do know my Pali. 
in my Buddhist texts. So when people say, where does this come from in Buddhism? I can quote texts if I really want to. So I can justify it for people who think I'm just making it up. He knows it's not being made up because it works. That's brilliant. Okay, I'm just getting. I've got another. Ten minutes? Yeah. Just to say that I found your YouTube um, broadcast uh, a lifeline in times of stress. So thank you. Um, But also, related to that, the worse um, agitation gets, I find the less likely I am to meditate. So I can meditate very well normally in my life on a daily basis. If I, you know, everything's going wrong, and I'm in a hurry, blah, blah, blah. Um, then I kind of sacrifice it sometimes, um, but when you need it the most. Exactly. This is one of the reasons why that meditation is very popular for people in high stress jobs. Why? <coughs> well, Similarly, how heavy is my glass of water? The longer I hold it, the heavier it feels. And soon after a few seconds, it will get painful and very uncomfortable to keep on holding. Most people think, I'm very busy, I've got to keep holding it. They keep pushing and pushing and pushing. That's where stress comes from. So when this gets too heavy to hold comfortably, what should I do? Put it down and rest for a few seconds. A very simple example. You rest for a few seconds, and when you pick it up again afterwards, it feels lighter. Same weight, the same duties, responsibilities. When I rest, afterwards it becomes easier to hold, with no stress. And that's gone as far as Harvard Business School, (coughs) where they call it an investment of time. Harvard Business, investment, got to use the right language. In investment of time. So meditation is not wasting time. It's making time. And it's so easy to see that if you meditate and rest, half an hour you rest. Which means in the afternoon you get three hours work done in two. The high quality. You know that, especially teach your kids that are doing A-levels or university exams. Study, 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 late at night, they're not productive at all. Sit in front of a computer, you've got no ideas, no sort of um, even putting a paragraph together, you can't do it. Your brain is stuck, it's tired. Instead of just pushing, 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 go and take a rest. Go do some meditation. If you can't actually find a place, go to the toilet. <laughs> Sit on that and you can tell your boss I'm constipated. <laughs> well, you are. To be honest. In the US, you go to the restroom. That's what they call the restroom rooms in the US. Take a rest. Well, what happens? You're not wasting time. You're actually making time. Because people think that to achieve and get things done, you have to work long hours. It's not just the length of time, but the efficiency which you're working at the time. Your brain is really efficient, sharp and rested. You get so much time in a short time. Even writing emails or writing books. There's a time you've got to write a book, a paragraph on something, and you look, no ideas come. I know by now, it's a waste of time. I just put it aside, meditate, or just go for a walk, relax, have a cup of tea. Then you go back, flow so easily. I could have wasted so much time. So when you meditate, you actually make it time. Can you give me a certificate? Yeah, okay. Certainly. <laughs> 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 yeah, the back. Can I ask about um, an addiction to the fruit? Um, it's kind of oh, yeah. Yeah, the rejection. Indeed, yeah. Look, it's sometimes people come up to me, I'm a muck, and they say, you're a loser. Yes, thank you for that wonderful compliment. I've lost so much. I've lost so much of my past, so much of my future, so much worry, so much concern, so much stress, so much suffering. 
I am a loser. People always think winning is actually happiness. It's not. The more you win, the more you have to protect. And the more you protect, the more you have to worry about. So, winning. You know, you win a tennis match and people have high expectations of you next week. You pass an exam. I shouldn't tell you, I know your kids aren't here, but some of them hear this. They say, you pass one exam. Are you free? Now you've got to do another exam next year. And you have to keep on doing exams until you finally fail them. Once you've failed one, then you're free. So I tell kids, fail it early in life, then you're free early and you can enjoy yourself. <laughs> so, you know, half of all children in Manchester are below average intelligence. Of course they are, that's what average means, isn't it? <laughs> but not my children, no, no, no. I wonder my children be below average intelligence. Somebody has to be. You know, the, I was a school teacher, and it stop me quick. I was a school teacher, and there was one kid, at the end of the year, bottom of the class, 30th in the class of 30. When I handed out the report cards, this is the old days, and, and when I handed out this report card, you can see this, oh, crikey, bottom of the class, dummy, I'm going to catch hell from my friends, but nothing like I'm going to get from my parents tonight. He really started to get depressed. So they knew I was a Buddhist, and they knew I was a kind, so I went up to him. I can't let somebody suffer like that, who came bottom of the class. If you had 30 Einsteins in the class, someone would have to come bottom. So I went up to him and said, Congratulations. You have come bottom of the class, and I know you. You've done that on purpose. So that none of your friends will have to suffer what you're going to catch from your parents tonight. You are someone who doesn't care about themselves, but cares about others. In Buddhism we call it the Bodhisattva. The one who sacrificed their own happiness so others don't have to suffer. And that's what you have done. You know, everyone else has just thought about themselves in this class. They want to achieve, they want to do well. But you haven't thought about yourself. It's always about other people. So I'm going to go to the head principal, his headmaster in those days, this evening, and I'm going to, to propose you for the Bodhisattva of the class award this year, <laughs> for the whole school, because of your great sacrifice intentionally taking the worst position in this class and so no one else has to suffer. And he looked at me as if I was crazy, <laughs> but at least he was out of his depression, he started laughing. But I did remind him before I left, he said, you're only allowed to be the Bodhisattva once in the school career. <laughs> 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 so next year, let someone else be the bottom of the class. What I was doing is actually taking off this, this stuff which you get from school. You don't come top, therefore you're a failure. That you have to succeed to be happy. When I was young, I was always taught, be successful, get a good career, be rich, be well respected, and then you'll be happy. I saw that didn't make any sense. Then somebody else came along, it was actually Daniel Goldman, Emotional Intelligence, saying, no, be happy first, and when, if you're happy first, whatever you do, you'll be successful. No. I didn't agree with any of those. Happiness is success. It's not that happiness leads to success. Not that success leads to happiness. Happiness is success. So if you're happy right now, you've made it, baby. <laughs> You're happy. That is success. So that's why what other people say about me is this water for that back. Or in the Buddhist tradition, it's like a lotus flower. A lotus flower, you can pee all over a lotus flower. And the smelly urine just falls off it, leaving no residue. You can't smell the pea. Or you can smell the smell of the lotus. Or you can, you can pour Chanel number five over the lotus. And after it all drips off, it still smells of the lotus, not of perfume. Nothing sticks to a lotus. So you'd be like a lotus. 
people praise you, they blame you. You have your own fragrance, irrespective of seeking for personal praise. It's not really being as vulnerable to other people's criticism. Being free. I can ask this. If you're happy, you're stay. Sorry, folks. <coughs> this is all you're going to get tonight. <laughs> Unless you're coming this evening for number two. If you are such an addict. <laughs> right. Okay. So, thanks again for coming. We've got to be out of here, otherwise we get fines. We can't afford it. Sorry? Oh, there's donations over there to pay for the fines. So, as you go out, we, we did actually pay so it's about the entrance fee. No. Do we say that? No. Do we say there's an exit fee? <laughs> <laughs> so this is, this is Venable Channel. The reason I'm here is not because Manchester makes the best fish and chips <laughs> in the world. It is because we're trying to actually get some equity so that there's a place for women in Buddhism. But instead of just complaining about it, we actually do it. The building monastery. For this young lady. <laughs> young lady, what's wrong with her? Lass. lass. Oh, yeah. This is Lass. <laughs> this holy Lass. <laughs> <laughs> so that we can have uh, a nice monastery. So, any of you, if you wish to lighten the load in life, to feel good that you're part of something wonderful, and to get me to come next year or the year after. Donation box is out. It's not so <laughs> It's not a donation box. It's called the letting go box. <laughs> so, lessen your burden. And just for a lot of time for the. Quickly for the suicidal spider. Okay, quickly, quickly. Once a little spider was born in Manchester <laughs> and made a nice little, little um, spider web in the corner of somebody's house. It was only there to finish the spider web. Hadn't eaten yet, and the owner of the house got a broom and smashed it to bits. And the poor spider had to run for his life. Went to the next house, another beautiful spider's web, really careful. And again, somebody smashed it to bits. Web after web after web after web got smashed to bits. And after nine webs had been destroyed and the spider had to run for his life, the spider got what we call post-traumatic stress was really afraid, started to shiver even the thought of a corner of a house. And was really, didn't know where to live, was, was homeless, was hungry. And started thinking, no one loves spiders. Well, I only take a corner of a house. I do a service. I catch uh, flies and mosquitoes and other bugs. You know, you don't want them in your house anyway. I don't harm you. I just keep your house clean with a tiny little corner. Well, I can live and rest and eat. No one loves spiders. And the spider started becoming depressed. And as he became depressed and hungry, thinking negative thoughts, the spider became suicidal. <laughs> you don't have, like, phone lines, suicide help lines for spiders. Even they didn't have mobile phones, which they don't. So anyway, the spider was so suicidal, he tried to crawl under people's shoes to get squashed. But you know when you're suicidal and depressed, you can't do anything right. Always got between like the, the soles and the heels, and then the heels of the soles, that, that way is part. So I decided I'm going to crawl across the road, get under a tram wheel or under a car wheel. Always got between the wheels, never underneath the wheels. You can't even commit suicide when you're depressed at the side of the So a staggering staggering along the road like some drunken person, not really knowing where they were going. But you know that sometimes you feel like someone's watching you? And so that was a suicidal spider thought. Someone was watching him and turned around and there was the fattest, happiest spider you've ever seen in your whole life, sunning itself, you know, in this, a, a very brief, a break in the crowd of the Manchester. Enjoying the moment of sunshine. And the happy jolly spider said, what happened to you? Why are you so miserable? 
And the suicidal spider told the sad story of its short life, rejected, depressed, hungry, homeless. And the certainly happy spider got out some tissues, so the suicidal spider could wipe its eyes. I mean, the happy spider said, well, why don't you come and stay with me? There's plenty of food where I live. That's where the suicidal spider, have a look at the fat growing spider. Where on earth can you live in Manchester? <laughs> where you get plenty of food, no one ever disturbs you. Oh, it says the suicidal spider. I live in the donation box for the Bikuni project. <laughs> <laughs> no one ever disturbs you there. So, there is a box, that's a bucket, isn't it? A bucket of bucks. But don't worry, there's plenty of room in there. So, <laughs> 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 better go now, have a happy night, day, whatever, and see you next time. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Oh, well, okay. No one? Okay, thank you. Oh yeah, I've got to wait a minute.